Okay, so well, let's, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, so well, it's a it's a pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Ronaldo, uh, Ronaldo de Menezes. Okay, so we have met. Actually, we met some time ago <laughs> in yes, our conference yes. and, and places like that. Uh, but just yeah, some, some, some history, some background about uh, Ronaldo. So he's uh, the professor of uh, data and network science in, uh, in Exeter University, and he's also the, the head of the computer science department there now. Um, before that, he was in, uh, in the Florida Institute of Technology with a similar, similar position. And uh, well, he, he got the PhD in, um, in computer science in the University of York in the UK. Um, he's a member of many, many scientific organizations like uh, I, uh, Triple E and uh, ACM, SBC, which is the, the Brazilian Computer uh, Society. And um, well he, he's also involved in, in the big conferences in our area like, uh, like NetSci. No? Um, well, I mean, he has published many, many, many papers, more than 100, according to this, <laughs> <laughs> to this thing. And I know, I mean, he's collaborating with other people all over the place, including hopefully us in <laughs> the near future. OK, so well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to, to have you here. And, uh, all right, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So um, actually, yeah, officially, I think we actually already collaborated because we wrote yeah, the survey. So um, <laughs> I hope that counts. So. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about crime, but, uh, but uh, because I got interested in trying to understand crime back in 2007, actually. And I stopped for a while, and now we, we did some works on, on it. But as it is sort of customary, right, I'm going to talk a little bit, since it's my first time here, I'm going to tell a little bit about my other interests before I actually get into crime. Right? So I generally start, when I'm talking about me, I put this picture there because I think it's the, the most beautiful picture I've seen from my city. I have to confess that. There's probably some, some image processing going on there, so, uh, so it is actually quite nice, it's very large. But in the U.S., I used to actually put this picture with the map showing where Fortaleza is. This is a city called Fortaleza, northeast of Brazil, because there people have a hard time finding out where any, any place in the world actually is, other than the USA, right? Uh, <laughs> and then you have to pinpoint and ask, answer questions such as, uh, are you in the northern hemisphere or, or southern hemisphere? <laughs> No. And then I tend to answer those sarcastically, right? Because I said we wanted to be in the northern hemisphere, but we didn't fit. So, <laughs> so then we got pushed down. Um, but as I was saying, right? So I actually did all my studies actually in Fortaleza. Actually, I went then went to Sao Paulo, um, uh, and then to the UK. Everything in computer science. And then it was around 2007 that. I started having this shift into this social network analysis, and more recently we started trying to actually do some, some, some inroads in, in sort of uh, um, computational models of, I guess, uh, human, human dynamics. Right. So I'm going to start actually from one of the first works we did. This is, I was visiting Laszlo Barabasi in his lab, and then there were some works that they published related to the spread of, um, of mobile phone viruses, right? And they were trying to, this has to do, I guess, with epidemic thresholds, and they were trying to actually answer this question, why we don't see some sort of outbreak of mobile phones uh, virus like we see in computers. Right? And I think at the time there was a publication that came out said that that has to do with the market share. Right? So none of the, the OS in, um, in the mobile phones have enough market share to actually allow the system to, to percolate. Um, but when I, when I got there, I started actually, because I had some work in security, so I started saying, well, but there's one thing that you guys are forgetting, which is there is this random, actually, event. So in virus, at least in computers, I can, uh, when a, a, a virus is trying to spread, it can do what this is called a random scan. Right? So basically say, I'm going to decide to go to a particular IP address and try to connect that. Uh, and of course, this has theory in this uh, in, in complex networks. So we took the same analysis that they had before, showing that there is basically no giant component, uh, but once you add the possibility of a mobile phone virus to do a random call, not only calling the, the, the numbers that are um, on, on the phone, I guess, uh, contacts, then you basically start seeing that this, this system percolates. And it was actually quite, quite timely we published this because once we published, I think it was a week later, there was the first occurrence of a mobile phone virus that actually was doing a random scan. So it, it, worked, it worked perfectly that way. 
Um, we also did, um, then I started actually becoming very interested in this um, network stuff at the, the time. So I started playing with Brazilian music. This is basically out of fun. Although we published in this music conference, it was very weird because everybody was a musician except myself. And, uh, but what we're trying to do is that Brazilian music is not because I'm Brazilian. It's kind of weird because all the, the, the songs are, are very collaborative in a sense. Right? So it's very hard for you to see in Brazil a music that was composed by one individual. Uh, so then what we were trying to find is basically trying to find a rank over time of the musicians that are there. So these are basically the known people and those are people behind the scenes. And what we found is that when you take this network and you remove these guys from behind the scenes, the people that not a single Brazilian person would actually know who they are, then the network completely disconnect, basically. And this is why we said that this is some sort of a the scaffolding, I guess, of the network, right? And I guess this is what actually got the paper published. We also played with uh, social sensing. I'm putting this because it's quite simple, but we put this because I'm now very interested in social sensing again, right? So basically using data from Twitter to try to find out what's going on, what people are talking about. Can we use this as some sort of measure of what uh, also, I guess, uh, gauge uh, opinions, right? So this is trying to find out what uh, uh, authors and people and Wikipedia and so on talk about Brazilian history and try to see if the, the, the individuals who end up becoming important are actually the ones that we believe in history to be important, and the answer, of course, is was yes. Right? Um, moving this, um, and again, please, please stop at any point because I'm just I have one slide about those things. Um, this is uh, my background before this interesting complex networks and, and complex systems was really. Well, I came from distributed systems and then I got into swarm intelligence. And for a long time, all my research was in swarms, particularly on uh, end column optimization and particle swarm optimization. Uh, but when I started looking at networks, we, we, we identified, and we're actually still working on this, um, I can speak for hours about that, is there is a huge problem in swarm intelligence, which is there are hundreds, if not more, <coughs> of different what we call uh, nature-inspired approach. Right? So people come and say, well, well, I just observed some bees fly, and then I have like a beehive. There's something called beehive. There's this thing called ABC, which is artificial bee colony. And then there's particle swarm optimization. There is bat algorithm. There are wolves, and, and any animal, fish, school search, and so on. Right? And the, really, the problem there is that if I come to you today, and I just observe some insect that I never saw, I came to Palma, maybe there's an insect that I never seen, and I decide to propose something based on that, you really have no idea if that algorithm is new, other than the inspiration being new, right? You don't know that, right? So I can say, dude, this algorithm does well, let's say, in, in multidimensional uh, 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 optimization problems, but then so what, right? So is that algorithm really the same as something else, right? And the only way we think that we can see this is to actually now bring the networks back into this, right? So into this, which is try to track uh, in this meso level what are the social interactions between the particles. Right? And so basically do some, some analysis on the dynamics of this, 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 what we call interaction network, and then observe the characteristics of that network, forgetting what is the inspiration. Right? So basically you can say, so here are certain, there's a network that tends, for instance, to have hubs, others don't. Right? So then we can perhaps, and that's what we're trying to get, perhaps compare an algorithm. Then I can say that perhaps uh, particle swarm optimization with local search is really like ACO without local search, right? Because uh, in this meso level, they behave the same. So we actually published a series of papers on this uh, for I think three or four algorithms, and the idea is to actually at some point propose this framework where if you propose a new algorithm based on swarm, we can extract uh, on the framework the social interactions and then tell you what class of problems you actually do, some sort of meta classification. Okay. Um, we we did some work on citations at some, some, some time in the past, and this, again, is, is, is returning because uh, we were trying to observe citations in computer science and how they organize, some, some uh, simple stuff. And then now, and this, uh, I'll join those two. This has to do with politics in Brazil. Then we also start looking at how parties, right? So this is actually quite timely in Brazil, if you know. We've been talking about Bolsonaro and, and so on, right? So which is unfortunate that that happened, at least in my opinion. But we can actually see Brazil has 37, I think, or so uh, political parties with representation in Congress. Right? Uh, so I think it's, 
quite unique in a sense. I mean, I don't think there is any other country that has so many with representation, and there are several without representation. So we start to actually to try to figure out a model that you take some sort of uh, scale from left to right and see how those parties evolve over time based not on roll call data, because this is what people do. I mean, generally, the, when people try to analyze the spectrum from left to right, they see how I vote on a particular issue. Uh, the problem with that is that if you have a new party, like we have in Brazil sometimes, a party just is created, we don't know because they never voted anywhere, <laughs> right? So there's not, nothing for me to actually gauge if that party is left or right, other than whatever is in the documents of the party, or uh, I have to wait until they actually have a presentation and vote. So we decided to look at the election data, right? So basically, people who run, and also where those individuals come from, in a sense, right? So, so the new party normally have individuals that came from another party. So this is when we start saying, well, maybe we can actually propose a social, um, a social influence model based on movement, where the, the fact that I go from place A to place B, I carry with me whatever opinion I had from that previous group. So my movement is what caused that party to be in that particular spectrum. Right? So then we can now estimate uh, where the party are, regardless of the party actually ever being represented uh, in Congress or not. So we, we did this, and why am I putting that? Is because we think we can use the same, the same model we're trying to extend. This is a lot simpler because it's, it's uh, just one dimension left to right. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to say, well, what if I have now basically uh, interest in terms of my academic background. So then it means that, um, we use myself as an example, right? So if I left Florida Institute of Technology after 18 years, and I was, I think, the only person working on network science there, once I left, uh, the Department of Computer Science, that became less computer science, less network science, right? And it became more of something. I don't know what it is. But there are basically attractors in other areas from other people. And basically, whatever the department was, it will move and actually became more network science, right? So can we model in the same way that we have those models and see what is the convergence? Can I actually place where departments are on this computer science? And we have all this data from the Association for Computing and Machinery. Uh, so, but we are about to publish the one on politics, and we're currently working on the one that is, is multidimensional. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. I have a visitor from, from the Brazil National Observatory who was a, um, a geo, geophysicist, uh, wanted to actually model um, earthquakes. Right? We ended up publishing three or four papers on that. Uh, and they basically showed that there is basically small world characteristics on that. We also showed that we, with this result that there are some, some long range correlations between seismic events. Um, but again, I, my, my contribution here is mostly on the network modeling there, so please do not ask me anything about earthquake because Brazil does not even have earthquakes, so mm -hmm. never, I never experienced one, so I don't know what it is. Um, this is actually still going on, and, and this has to do with organ transplantation in the United States, right? So this is an active research project that we have with uh, um, University of California, Davis. Um, one of my students is now a postdoc there, and this guy here who was at UCLA, Martin, is now heading some sort of institute related to organ transplantation in UC Davis. So what we, at some point, we were approached, and in fact, this came through Laszlo's lab, actually was Martin knew Cesar Hidalgo that you may know, uh, and then Cesar said, well, maybe you should contact Ronaldo, uh, because Cesar was in the process of getting a job to, to MIT, and fortunately, this actually ended up being quite, quite nice, for, at least for my lab. But the idea was what Martin wanted to do is to create the social network of, of people uh, based on organ donation, right? If, uh, if I have an individual die or maybe even a living donor gives an organ to someone, then there is a link in there. Well, we don't have to think a lot to understand that this doesn't really work, right? Because we have data from 1987 to today. This, in the United States, we have every, everything has been tracked since 1987 because there was a law that says that an organ is a national resource. Um, but from 1987 to now, it means that what we have is an individual who died uh, and then the, the re recipients, right? So I need to wait many, many generations for me to actually have this network to actually, as I said, to have a giant component. So that didn't work. So I'll tell you how in the next slide how we did it. But first we decided to just say, okay, just out of curiosity, 
how is this distribution in terms of donors and recipients in the United States? And with that, we already showed that there is some indication of some weird phenomena, right? So for instance, we, if you look at more, the more urbanized areas, the red points means that there is sort of a, a deficit of organ in that particular location, so there are more recipients than donors, right? And the green ones, there are more donors than recipients. But if you go and look in general, you will see that the more developed, uh, or they say more urbanized, they are consumers, I hate to say this, consumers of organs, while the more uh, rural areas, they are suppliers of organs, right? And by the way, we are actually not using the hospital here because when I presented this, I actually presented this net side like a couple years ago. Uh, the question is generally, all right, but you have more hospitals in New York, right? But it's not where the transplant was done. It's basically the residence of the, of the people. We actually have the data where they live before actually the, uh, basic, by the time they actually registered. So we think that this actually happens. So we have other phenomena. Oh, sorry. We have some other issues. Like if you look at Atlanta here where you have the poorer suburb, suburbs of Atlanta actually are more green than the center, right? So again, you see, even at a sort of a smaller scale, this phenomenon of poorer giving organs to, um, to, uh, to let's say, richer areas, right? So you take this with a grain of salt, you understand that as you want, right? So uh, we decided to actually do, do a network, but we decided to do a network based on not from a person to another one, but from location to location, right? So we basically say, that are organs going from, from Florida to New York. And the reason this is important to do is, uh, important to do is because um, that is one of the big issues when deciding where an organ goes is distance, right? There's this thing called, uh, um, what is it called? Um, oh, there is a time, there's a, there's a, there's a medical name that I forget now, that's the, basically the survivability of the organ outside the body, right? So things like such as heart, they last about four hours, and then after that, they really go through a phase transition that the heart is really useless, right? So it has to be transplanted within that, and the degradation happens really, really suddenly. So, which means that if I see, for instance, that an organ is going from here to there, or if this is happening a lot, right, from Florida to California, then it just by plane here is four and a half hours, four hours, so it means that it's probably uh, it's not good, right? It shouldn't be happening there. Right, so whoever made the decision, because there is a system, but there's always a doctor that goes there and says, no, I'm going to assign to this particular person. There is a human in the loop, right? So when we do this at the stake level, and you take these two organs, and then once you take the whole network, uh, and you apply some sort of uh, um, uh, community that action, just to see, you can see that the areas for heart are very well defined, and this is actually good, right? So it basically means that the organs in this orange part tend to stay there, uh, the, or the organs in this blue part tend to stay there, right? So, but you see sort of slightly different for kidney. Okay, kidney survives longer, so we allow, uh, kidney can stay, I think, 48 hours outside the body, and it should be okay. But funny enough is that this is at the state level. So what appears to be organized at the state level, and if I actually go to the zip code level, right? And of course, I'm not here, you have the nodes, I don't have the edges, otherwise you're not going to be able to see anything, then you don't see the area so very, so well defined as you see at the state level. So that organization at the course level really doesn't exist, this locality. In the kidney, you actually see a lot better, right, this locality, but then reviews other things, right? So if you see there are predefined areas in the United States, uh, this means that, um, and I'm going to stay too long on this, but the point is that the, the system is supposed to say if an organ is available in the, in the southwest of the United States, it should generally first be assigned to people in the southwest and then go a higher, larger and larger radius. Right? Um, but the area in the United States for the southeast is actually this purple area and the red. Right? So what caught our attention is that this sub-area here, which is basically Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, should not be isolated from that rest. So when we actually look at this deeply, it seems that there is some sort of racial bias. This is the largest concentration of African Americans or black people in the United States. And what this is indicating is that organs that are available here tend to stay here within the black community. Organs that are, let's say, on the white parts tend to stay on the white parts. And again, that's not for me to, to solve the problem, I'm just pointing out that the issue exists, somebody, the human in the loop, is there is some sort of racial bias there, and it's up to social works to actually solve that problem. Just a couple more. We, eventually we decided to look at uh, human mobility, so we published a paper on this recent CF fact, and this is basically 
an extension, I guess, to the, uh, to the to work of, of Xiaomi Song. And we were just trying to account for the fact that people have a preference to choose a location that you <coughs> visit recently. And what the paper is trying to show is that if you look at data, we, we tried several data sets, that is, if you take two locations, one that I visit recently, but not frequent, and one that I visit frequently, but not recently, then I have a higher chance of actually going to the one that I visit recently, but never frequently, but never visited before, right? So, uh, so this is why you see some sort of preference on this side, which is, let's say, the recency side. Uh, now, this last one, before I go back to crime, is I tend to say, I was presenting this to my student, and I said that never do this, what I did here, because this was a dream I had, and I don't recommend anybody trying to do science by dreaming. <laughs> uh, but, and it was the first time, I actually have this, this, this thing that I, I leave a sort of a notebook next to my bed with a hope at some point to dream about something really nice, right? Never worked. Except this time that was actually, I, I had this dream when we were working on human mobility that I was actually physically walking, there was this environment, and I was physically walking from a site to a site. So I remember being standing and it'd be below me there was like Google, right? Mm -hmm. And I would move to Facebook or something. And so I came back and said, well, could we actually see this movement of web visitations as movement, as physical movements? And can we see what kind of patterns would emerge from there? Uh, we didn't think we'd be similar uh, because, of course, in the physical world, I have a physical limitation. I can't go back to Exeter and be there in the next hour due to physical limitations, but I can basically go to any website I want. So there is no really space constraint there, if you think about that. Right? But what we found is that, if you see on the top here, is that the patterns, this is sort of called returners and explorers, the patterns that you see from, if you look at uh, Filippo's paper that has something like that, you can see that there is some, some resemblance on, on the patterns that we see in the physical world. So in order to get that, we had to actually take that uh, visitation, the trajectories, and actually look and create a space, right? So if I want to measure radius of gyration, I need to actually have a space. So we use an algorithm called sort of spring embedded approach, uh, which basically tries to, uh, to create those islands, and then we measure the radii based on this space. And we said, well, is this, is, this, is this okay? I mean, can we do that? So we took the real data, the here you see in green, and this V and this R. The, the R is the real data, physical data. And then we took the same physical data, forgot, we just basically forgot the location, and we applied a spring embedded. And we can see that by applying, this is just a sanity check, by applying the same algorithm to the physical data, we get similar results, which means that this, this approach of using the spring better maybe works. Right? So we're now trying to see if we can build trajectories for other things. Anyway, sorry for taking so long. So I'm going to talk a little bit about crime. Right? So, but before, any questions on anything there? All right, so, so maybe in there. All right, crime, right? So it happens everywhere, right? Um, it's the different types of it. So you can see this is just downloaded last night from uh, YouTube, right? So top one is supposed to be theft, although I think there is some sort of modern theft going on there, right? Uh, because I, I thought theft, you're not supposed to, I mean, something that people don't catch you in a sense or have this fight, so there's probably some assault going there. Then you have here burglary and you have robbery, right, are happening. So, of course, crime is ubiquitous, right? So this is map of uh, places where uh, crime takes place, just a few large cities in the world, and red means a lot of crime, and as you can see, I point into Brazil, which seems to be a constant red there, doesn't, doesn't change, unfortunately. At the same time, cities actually start looking at this idea of tracking data related to crime, right? So what is going on, right? So this comes uh, from, I think, I think it's uh, it is in, in Japan, I don't know, um, but again, I took from the web, basically you have this, uh, Rio de Janeiro actually has something like this now, uh, I wonder, I never visited, but I heard it's the state of the art, and I'm sure they have a lot of data because there's a lot of crime in Rio. Um, but the point is that now we're using this idea of data analytics to try to understand crime. Uh, so how did this all start? Uh, it started really because in 2009, well, this actually was in 2007, I went to Brazil on a project to do something completely irrelevant, and it's really irrelevant because it was out of, a, out of spite, really. Uh, so there was a, I, I guess I have to tell you, right? So 
I, I, I'm a computer scientist, and as a computer scientist, I have this, this thing that I don't like software engineering, right? So, which causes a problem at home because my wife is a software engineer. <laughs> but, uh, but I criticize software engineering for the lack of rigor, right? And things that's always based on, oh, why did you do that? Oh, because I always done this way and it works. So out of this conversation, eventually there was a software engineering institute that says, do you think you can do better? I said, well, I think I can do better. So, so then we wrote a project, which I was hoping not to be accepted, but I ended up being accepted. <laughs> so I went to Brazil to work on software engineering to apply swarm intelligent approaches to software testing. Well, as I said, I don't like that very much, but at the same time, there was a collaborator there working on crime, and I started looking at crime and say, can we use models of swarm intelligence so that we say criminals are like ants and locations that they commit crime uh, basically the attractors or the food sources, so maybe that worked, and I said, oh, I'm sure that's gonna work beautifully, right? And it didn't, uh, it didn't work at all. Um, and, and then I, that was actually the first time that we start thinking about why is this not working. We had the data of the crime in Fortaleza, but we also had the social network of the criminals. So the problem is that before we are not considering that criminals communicate through the social network, and once we actually added that, in some sort of uh, a transition rule to update this pheromone, which is the attractiveness of a particular location where you have the criminal's own experience and what they learn from their social network, then the model worked really well. And in fact, the picture that you see here, this is visually, but you can see that there's some correlation in terms of the hotspots. So this is crime against property, right? The location where you're actually committing crime is fixed. Okay. So this is why I was interested in crime. But then I got a student and we start actually looking at crime again. This was um, three, four years ago. Um, so what is happening right now? Well, first of all, there's no more people living in cities, right? So you can see here that it's 2005 in here, more or less, we have more people in urban areas than, than in rural areas, right? And a lot of crime and urban uh, crime happens in urban areas. So at the same time, we have this idea of this emerging of city analytics, right? So there's a lot of guys like, like Jose, trying to look at regularities, human dynamics, so we have plenty of data that we can actually track how people are moving around. So the, the, there's, always, there's also been some, some work from, this is a seminal paper from Bittencourt, right, 2007, that tries to look at some of those urban indicators as a function of population growth, right? And he basically divides and says that if you take uh, things that have to do with infrastructure, they grow sublinearly uh, as a function of population growth, and if you take social aspects, they tend to go super linearly with growth. So if we decided to actually look at crime, first thing we did was, so let's, because there is already crime there, so let's just first try to look at this from a disaggregated point of view, different kinds of crime. you treating crime, every crime as, as the same thing, perhaps we should look at separately, right? So then we said, okay, what's happening to different types of crime? And we see that, yes, Bittencourt is, is correct, not only in the aggregated, but even on the disaggregated data. So if we concentrate on burglary, robbery, and theft, the three videos that I show you, there is some sort of superlinear growth uh, on, on crime as the population growth. And there's a city here in the UK, just to see that we didn't uh, look at only, only the US. We kept moving forward, right? So we see if we can find something different. And then we start saying, okay, what about how this crime is actually distributed across the city, right? So is there something there for us to actually find? So the first thing we did is to basically say, and there were a couple of publications on that, is to say, okay, let's take a simple approach that you have crime and you know where they are, especially where the crime took place. This is part of the data set. What if we assume in a very naive way that if two uh, crime events happen near to each other, they are somehow linked. Why? I don't know, but let's assume they are, right? So maybe they're committed by the same gang or so on, right? But simple model that I can create then from this, uh, I can create a network like that. So what is this network revealing to me? Well, what we decided to do is to take Brockman's group approach, which I don't know if you're familiar, called the borders of small world, where you take a network and you then can split this into parts, leading to areas such as this, right? So you leave to borders. And then we can try to correlate this with social indicators. So when we actually take socioeconomic factors, uh, so take this area here, and you look and we paint, you can see that the borders seem to correlate with differences in terms of income, uh, education, and so on. So which means that even a simple approach, such as connecting a, 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 a crime event with the one that is next to it, seem to give me some information right, in terms of how the gangs or whatever 
are distributed um, so that you can see here that the borders seem to coincide with the, the factors. We kept moving forward, right? So we decided to see, okay, what about this? This law of crime concentration that basically says that, of course, you have small locations, a few locations that are responsible for more crime, and you have several locations that do not have crime if you take a large area. Um, this is something that actually I love to work with the police because I don't have access to the, to the data in Fort Allison anymore. I'm now move, now that I moved to the UK, I'm hoping to actually, I mean, Exeter is a larger city, not larger than the one I was, but I actually tried to work with the police in Melbourne, Florida, where I was for 18 years, but I had a meeting and the chief of police in Melbourne said that I don't need to do this because there are three criminals in the whole city and we know who they are, right? So, <laughs> okay. But, um, so I said, oh, can we, I want to predict where the hot spots are. Well, the hot spots are three guys, right? So, <laughs> Uh, but uh, we, 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 we look at, okay, let's look at the distribution again based on the three, um, the three types of crime that we, we took. And people sometimes ask me, why you take those three? Well, we could take others, but others are difficult to get. For instance, data about rape is very difficult to get, right, because of privacy uh, concerns. So those are the ones that tend to be common in every city in the world that has this open data, uh, data policy. So you can definitely see that, at least visually, there is some differences in there. So we want to try to find if there are regularities there. So if we want to do this, and we want to disregard population, right, because what I want to say is that a crime concentration is how much it concentrates regardless of the uh, population size. I don't want to say there's more crime there because there's more people living there, right? So because that we already know, Bittencourt already said, I mean, crime grows with population, so I, I want to sort of disregard that issue. So what it is that we have to take a city like that is somehow have to divide it uh, so that the population in each of those little squares is more or less uniform, right? So that's the then sort of we trying to, um, as I said, minimize the effect of population. So what we did is that the only network, so we take an area, we basically do a, a tessellation of this, right? And then we, we start, sorry, and then we start, we join those cells until we actually get to a collection of cells that have more or less the same population size. So imagine, I know what the population here, population there, so maybe this one is two times the population of those two, so I'll join those two so that they will be more or less uniform. And then I end up with a network of locations where Every point in here is a location in the city with more or less the same population size. And once I have this network, I can use some sort of graph partition. I can divide this in any way I want, right? Um, so that I have larger areas if I want to. So this is everything that we're doing is based on that, on that, on that. So we took data from several cities, right? So um, this is the ones that we use on, on the paper, on the PLOS paper. Um, and again, this is, the, the choice in here has to do with the fact that those cities have the three types of crime we had, we wanted to deal with. All right, concentration, we decided to say, okay, let's look at the Lorenz curve, which basically saying that this is uniformity there, right? And of course, the lower the line in here, the more concentrated things are, right? So and, and when we plot for a particular city, uh, this is what, Chicago, I think? I don't know, I said somewhere here, Chicago. Um, then you see that there seems to be slight difference between uh, burglary, robbery, and theft. In the in sense that theft seems to concentrate more than robbery, and, uh, robbery than, and then burglary. So but this is maybe this is just Chicago. So we took them for every city and we did the same thing. And then once we actually apply, just so you see the colors here, you can see that there's a clear distinction between the concentration so of, those, of those, those types of crime. So it means that there is some regularity there on the concentration. Right? So this always tend to be more concentrated than that, and this always seem to be more concentrated than that. We try to also look at the distribution of those events, right? And you can see that uh, they seem to have different exponents for that. This is again, it's just Chicago, but <coughs> once we do for every city, you can, I mean, you can see the KD here. You see constantly theft in this side, with this range from 2 to 2.5, and then the, the green one is more spread, so I don't see um, sort of a, um, a regularity there, but at least we see that there seems to be green less concentrated on that exponent. Right? Now, maybe this has to do with the population still, right? So this is why 
on my next slide, what we do is to basically do an independence test, but if you just cons concentrate on that, you can see that here are the exponents, right, um, of the thefts, right, in relation to cities of different population. And you can see that as population grow, the concentration seems to remain the same. And what does this mean? Well, this really means that now, if you know that, is that they, for a small city, let's say like Palma, right, crime concentrates exactly in the same way that it concentrates in New York, right? So it's, the difference is how many events we have, but not how the concentration actually happens across the city. Right? So, and even for the for, for the burger, which is a little weaker, you can see that there is some sort of independence there. Could, could, could you please uh, tell us the difference between theft, robberies, and, and burglaries? Sure. Theft, I mean, I, I don't think criminologists agree that much, but theft is generally when uh, you, somebody takes something from you and you don't notice, right? So it could be from your pocket, a pickpocket. It could be from a store that it just happened and the person went away, right? So robbery is somebody actually breaks in, right, on a bank or, or a store and try to take money. And generally it's assumed that there could be violence, right? And, and burglary uh, is sort of the same as robbery, but no, no violence, right? So burglary is somebody breaks in your house, but went away, right? So, and there was no interaction with people in general, right? So if you remember the video that I had in the beginning, the guy that entered the house, so that is actually a burglary, right? So, no, it's a burglary because there was no, nothing happening in terms of confrontation that could maybe, would never lead to, 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 to violence. This one may lead to violence confrontation with the police and so on and so forth. And, and theft is, is just one simple thing in a sense, right? Okay. Um, all right, so, um, okay, so now what we're doing, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this, is trying to look at how, because one thing is to say crime concentrates in a particular way, right? But I don't know if the hotspots or the level of concentration, or how many hotspots, if those things are actually constant, right? So if I take an area of the city, and which seems to be, let's say, dangerous, Right? Would I always see that area as dangerous? So we decided to actually look in terms of how the, what's the dynamics of those hot spots. Because it could be that there is always the same concentration, but there is some sort of fluctuation between this area being, being dangerous, this one being dangerous, and so on. Right? And we actually, there's a paper that just came out um, a couple of months ago uh, from, on EPJ that we actually um, discussed that in, into more detail using. Um, 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 anyway, we're using, there was, there's, this is a name that I was going to, anyway, I'll, I'll get it there. Um, but we, we, what we're trying to do is then, this, this part was just to, um, uh, to look at um, the, the rink stability of those locations, right? In a sense, is what we take time and we say at this particular is a lot of time, we have that this area here is the most dangerous one, this is the second most dangerous, and third and so on. And then we can do this for several slices. And then once we do that, what we do is that we take this column, we can actually calculate uh, the entropy of this particular location as a measure of how stable that location actually is, right? So take the most dangerous area, how stable is it? Does it tend to be the most dangerous area, right? So we, if we do that, uh, we apply that and we do for every city, then we end up with something like that, right? Which basically is saying that the dangerous areas tend to be more stable, and the ones that are, uh, say, when you actually go to the fifth or so on, it becomes actually quite, and there's quite a lot of variety there, the second, third, fourth, and so on, they tend not to be uh, so, so stable in terms of being dangerous all the time. Uh, and we also see some difference in terms of this stability from different types of crime, right? So you can see here that uh, the, the division by theft, robbery, and burglary as well, right? So there is uh, no stability at all, for instance, if you see from the point of view of burglary, and there is more stability, if you think, uh, in terms of the locations that are dangerous for, for theft, okay? Um, any questions? Well, so now there is a question. Uh, do you have more than the same number of, uh, of uh, 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 we, we have 
we don't have the same number of events, but we have quite a lot of events in each of those cities, right? So the cities are large enough, right? So like I, I never use my city with three guys, right? So we are always taking cities that have quite a lot of those, those, those three. Okay. Uh, now, my, my, I think it's my last slide or the last but one is, is mostly say, why are we doing this? Right. Uh, so what is the purpose of that rather than just curiosity of trying to understand the dynamics of that, right? It's mostly to try to guide police forces on how sort of countermeasures they can actually do. So and what happens in practice is, for instance, suppose that you have a city of Portland, right? And then the city of Portland has a particular characteristic not only on concentration but also on the dynamics of the hotspots. So, it happens a lot that a mayor or some city does a very good job on actually doing the, the police. And they say, well, this city, people reduce the crime a lot. And then what happens in general? Well, at least in the US, in Brazil, is that people imitate, right? They said, well, let's do what is happening in New York, right? I mean, they did that, it's gonna work for me. Well, it really won't, you don't know, unless you have the same sort of dynamics as that city. So what we are trying to do is to basically guide the choice, right? Is uh, support your decision is so that I know that f if something works in Chicago, maybe it will work in Portland because they have similar characteristics, but probably not going to work in Chattanooga, right? So maybe if you are Chattanooga, you should choose something that maybe worked in Kansas City. So we can actually do clustering of those cities, right? So that you can make a decision, say those are more similar, therefore, something that works in here w may work in there as well. Anyway, so if I did my job correctly in terms of talking about crime, right, so um, then you should look at those two pictures and you should know which type of crime is the one on the left and which type of crime is the one on the right, right? And if you remember the types of crime that I said to you, right? So nice, this is not a test, right? So, um, so this is theft, high concentration, not a lot of um, change in here, right? And this is actually a burglary. Right? So, so which basically uh, the, the, the longitudinal picture of what is happening here, you so don't see a lot of patterns <laughs> going on, but you see some sort of concentration staying there. This thing, right? So what I want you to, for you to understand is there are different crime dynamics, different crime uh, types of concentration, right? So this is, diff this is independent of the size of the, of the city. And we really need guys like you, particularly doing some more of the analytical people uh, stuff in terms of trying to come up with models of crime, right? Because we need models and we have real-time data so that we can guide uh, uh, the policing better, right? So, Basically, we organize, we try to actually have as an incentive, we organize something at NetSci every year. Uh, calls are open if you still want to look at crime for this thing called net crime. I think it is in the fifth edition or so on. Right? So we are moving on, on the, we are working on the, this is one that is actually um, quite exciting. Well, exciting is probably the <laughs> worst word to say when you're talking about pedophilia, right? <laughs> Uh, so maybe I need to find a synonym for this, but uh, we have, and I don't recommend any marriage work that data, it's absolutely horrible, right? But uh, the federal police, we, we, we collaborate with them and they have data about pedophiles in Brazil. Um, and what we're trying to do is to see, well, I can tell you what the, the paper will have, is that pedophilia seems to behave sort of like a gateway drug to uh, more serious crimes, right? So those guys have data and they can track over time through years, uh, and this is because of the laws in Brazil, that someone became, a, or when, when, when a particular pedophile start only to look at pictures, right? So they have uh, the levels, there's an intensity there. So when they start basically saying, yeah, I only look at pictures of naked children, right? And then they move into actually uh, having sex with the children. Then they move into actually baiting the children to do. And they move into, into actually harming them a lot, tying them and so on. And when we look at this, they actually have data, even pictures and so on. And I was the first thing I said, I do not ever want you to send me the pictures, right? So I don't need the pictures to actually do this. 
So I just need to know where, which channels or which uh, category they are in which point of time. So we're basically saying that it seems that every p uh, pedophile seems to follow this path from just curiosity, right, that they go to the sites and they just look, but they end up, after a few months, into the more hardcore things, right? So as if looking at the picture is not hardcore, but anyway, so you see, you, you, you see what I mean, right? So, and this is um, what we're trying, we're trying to get into. So thinking the people that have been involved in this, those are guys that have been funded by the National Science Foundation and were in my lab for some time. This guy is actually joining, he was at Rochester, but he's joining Exeter. Uh, Marcos is, is, is the main guy working on crime. He's at uh, uh, Jesses, which is actually a social science institute in, in Germany. And those are two um, collaborators. There's a mathematician, there's a computer science that used to be his advisor in the past, right? So the paper uh, there, okay. Those two papers there, I said, this one um, uh, uh, is the, the one that I talked about. This one came out, actually, it says 2018, but it really was like mm. end of 2018, so it was like you know, December or something. Right? So, and I appreciate, uh, again, thank you for inviting me here. about the boundary, the, it looks very homogeneous. The, the one on the right side, yeah, that one looks quite homogeneous. No, the one on the right side. Yes. That quite, looks quite homogeneous, the distribution. Wouldn't you expect to be more concentrated in rich areas of the city? Uh, it could, I mean, it's true, right? Uh, we, we didn't consider the, the effect of the rich areas there. Um, I think the city is Portland, you're going to have in the U.S. several rich areas. Uh, so it could be that you see the homogeneity has to do with how wet the, the, the rich people don't live in just one, one, one location. Right? But you'd be, I mean, there is surprise if you look at the data that there is burglary in poor areas as well, right? Uh, because it, it, people are basically trying to burglarize and get some microwave or, or something, right? Following this this question, you have you have defined the the areas uh, as having constant population. Constant population means uh, probably constant resident population. Yes. So, uh, I for example, I, I imagine that the the concentration of theft is well, I don't know in Portland, but here in in Palma, it will be concentrated in the center of the city where all the tourists are, and uh, and this is the it will be concentrated where the objectives are, not where the population res is resident. So it's, is this any, any way to normalize the, not by population, but by, by objectives? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought, I mean, I got a, a similar question. I thought you can be a richness, but yes. probably not for all types of. I think the most important thing that we have to include in the future, you're absolutely right, right? That's the resident population because that's the data that exists most, most, most often. For real, because we have access to mobile phone data, we are trying now to look at transient uh, uh, population there, right? So perhaps we can use from Twitter as well. But I think, I don't think the, the distribution of the richness of the socioeconomic factors will be, in my, my gut feeling, it's not gonna be as important as me knowing where the tourists are, right? So there are cities that double in size, triple in size, depending on the time of the year. I'm assuming Palm is probably something like this, right? So, and, and I don't know if the distribution of those individuals in the city is the same as the resident. They're probably, probably not, right? Um, so they probably actually go to places that people don't reside, which is more just restaurants and, and so on. So, but it's very difficult to get that data, right? But you're right. I mean, I hope this com doesn't completely invalidate what, what we've done, but it would be nice to actually add that data. all in uh, cities. Any idea of how that would compare with uh, uh, non-urban areas or rural areas? Uh, short answer, uh, Maxi, is no, because there isn't a lot of crime. Uh, enough for us to, to do some statistics on it, right? So uh, if you, and, and it's very poor, when it exists, it's very, I mean, we're dealing with the UK and the US, right? It's very poorly 
reported in a sense of geotag, right? So very complicated to know. Uh, if you take, for instance, a farm and so it was burglarized, right? So how many, and, and that farm is the only farm in the, that countryside, how many times can that farm be burglarized? So I actually think it's going to be very hard to do it because, well, I would say, unfortunately, there is not enough crime, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I mean, it could be, if you find a, a location where there is a lot of data related to, to uh, rural areas, we can do probably the same approach. No, but what I mean is that there are cities in the sense of a city, in many places in Europe, you have many people living in, in areas which are not considered part of the city. So, yes, yeah, so Oh, no, no, so, okay, so, so let me put it this way. Oh, those analyses that we do for, for, for New York and for Portland, for Chicago, is really not just the city center, right? We're taking the greater Chicago, right? So it does include the suburbs. So it just doesn't include the, 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 say, what we call rural areas, right, where you just have a farm and so on. So that doesn't, I mean, the area that we take is actually quite large. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. But we basically, we can say that Santa Monica is sort of like a small Chicago, if you want. Right? And, that, and that's really what we're trying to do. Or the other way to say is to say that New York is really just a, a several small cities combined. Right? So it's like if of the boroughs can be seen as, 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 as one city. At some point you talk about models. So uh, in this case, for instance, for the theft and for do you, apart from the visualization of the money, which is the, say, the characteristics of the, of, the, of, of the distribution of the places, is uh, any sort of models of, say, uh, I assume that these thefts are done by a set of people and there is a connection between these events in the same way that you did for the other things at the beginning, and this distinguishes I'm not sure I understood the question. Are there models for this and the models or models? Generative models of this? Say models in the, in the sense of, pre, of, of, us, of assuming that a sort of theft has been done by the same group of people, for instance, that are many which are this group of people, how they will behave, how this will change in time. Are these, these sort of things the same, the same for all the kinds of crime? Um, if I understood correctly, no. I don't think there are models of that because not in order to find if it is the same group of people, I mean, and if you want to confirm, you would have to find, again, data where we know the, that information and we have absolutely no idea who committed that crime. Um, not every, I mean, Fortaleza that I worked initially, where I knew the social network, uh, it's actually an exception, right? Because the police actually kept track that I was arrested with that person, right? And then I know the, the connection of people and I know the type of crime they committed, right? So here I don't know who's committing the crime. I just know where they happened. So, so most of these guys are unsolved. I mean, they, don't, they even find out who was the responsible. Well, they find out who's responsible, but I mean, the data, I'm sure they, they find out and they're arrested, but the data that we get, which is the public data, doesn't say the name of the person. So we don't, we, we, we don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, could, could you show one more time the, the graph with the entropy and the positions of the city? The, yeah. Oops. Oops. Um, this one? Yes, because I, I don't know if I got it, uh, but it is like the, the most secured uh, zones uh, have a more, let's say, universal behavior regarding the fluctuations, like uh, the, 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 the fluctuations I mean, the secure zones are, uh, yeah. The, s the secure one? Yeah, the, the, the larger positions in the list have like the kind of same behavior in all the cities? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, well yeah on, the, on, the, on the right side of the graph. The right of the graph. Yes, that part there? 
Yeah. We're just saying that the rank of those locations, in yeah. terms of being the fifth, the sixth, the eighth location, changes a lot more often than this. So it means that yeah. the areas that are, uh, we, this area could still be safe, right? Okay. I'm just saying that the area that crime concentrates the most, the number one, okay. tends to always be the one that concentrates the most. Okay. But in terms of the amount of crime, it could be that it's just three crimes. Right, okay. so it, okay. it, it, it's not about the safety, but it's basically saying how this, how this, this map of this hotspot, how is it changing over time? Right, so what you see is that the, the top two here, they tend to stay the same. The other ones fluctuate a lot. Okay. Right, and again, I forgot to say this is this is quite important in, in terms of police because there is a there is a there is some theories in, in criminology that says that you really cannot stop crime at all. Right. The only thing you can do is to make criminals commit crime where they not, in locations that they are not familiar with. <coughs> so basically, I need to force the criminal to go and commit, because if you're a criminal, you're a criminal, right? You will do it, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's your, that's your job, right? So, so, and then what you do is that the only thing, I have to, I have to make you actually go to a location Okay. That you're not familiar with the streets and so on, because that increases the chance of you being caught. Okay. Right? So that's why the only thing the police, I mean, intelligent police means making them go to locations where they are not familiar with. Okay. Um, well, uh, similarly to the previous questions, I mean, have you tried to like correlate with some sort of economic dis distribution of economic activity? I mean, I wonder that maybe I don't know in Wall Street. There is not much people living there, but there is a lot of economic activity. And then you have like more crime, but because there is less people living there and more like business or banks. Yes, or yes. Look, as I was answering this question, to be honest, I mean, the truth is that I don't know if we tried because Marcos has a lot more results than the one we published in the paper, right? So it's something that, I mean, I can follow up with him. I, 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 I don't remember having this conversation with him. But there were just a few things that we actually put in the paper, right? So we, we were trying to find certain regularities, and m my feeling is that he probably tried, right? Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think we tried, but, well, I'm not, I, I was not informed that he tried, but if I know him well enough, I think he did. Right? <laughs> okay, so one last question from me. Uh, in Brazil, you have the data of uh, where these uh, criminals are living. Uh, so did you check uh, <laughs> if there was any pattern between the, where they, they live and where the crimes are committed? I mean, I, I will help. I mean, but I mean, what I hope is some kind of anti-correlation, because I guess that they are not going to commit the crime in the neighbor, because the neighbor knows them. <laughs> so but, but did you see anything like that? No, I, I have not. But my collaborator at that, that time, Vasco, who continued to work with the police there, he tried and he, I think he has a paper published on this. And you are right, criminals do not commit crime where they live, right? So the, the, there is always a trip, right? And, and I don't know if he actually look at the regularities of that, but I know him, I remember him telling me that there is this, uh, as you're saying, what the criminal doesn't want is call attention to the location where they live, right? So because if I commit a crime in that location, the police will go there, not here, where I live, right? And it's okay for the police to go there as long as I'm not there, right? Um, and then there's also also some sort of uh, this this kind of um, there's this phenomenon called repetitive offense or something, right? So if 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 uh, if some place is burglarized, uh, there is a probability of it being burglarized in a short time period again. Okay. Well, so thank you, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Was it okay? Is it okay? <laughs> and I was trying to remember.